morning, church. Good morning. Now, if you'd like to take notes, <laughs> I'll go grab you a clipboard and a pen, and you can take notes for the sermon. Just let me know. Um, so, so that we good for right now. Um, in addition to that, yesterday we had a great day. It was a powerful uh, celebration, uh, celebrating God and the marriage between Shannon and Bruce. It was just, it was just a fun day. I mean, the weather was not, well, it was nice out and it was just really muggy, but beyond that, it was a great day. We had wonderful people there. Um, everybody was having fun. Um, and for those of you that are joining us online, and, um, welcome. We're glad to have you here. Um, got some things that are coming up. So July, no, we're in July. It's going to be August. How did that happen? We're almost, we're over halfway through the year now. Coming in August on the second Saturday, we've got Orange Track Racing, uh, which is our uh, 42 foot long four lane Hot Wheels track. So if you remember from when you were kids that Orange Hot Wheels track, that's what we use. We start over there and we run it almost all the way to the other corner of the room. We just have lots of fun. We have a kitchen that's open up. So you don't have to leave to grab anything to eat. And keep it, the prices are really low. It's a, it's a great time, a great way to have a lot of family fun. And then on September 18th, and we'll throw this in the comments uh, for those of you that are watching online, and at the end we'll show the trailer, but we're going to be showing the movie What If. And if you all know uh, Kevin Sorbo, he's the, the lead in it, and well, I'll just let you watch the trailer. That way you can see what it's all about. It's a really, really great movie talks about what if. Um, other than that, I don't think I've got anything else. Mark, do you I missing anything for that announcements? Well, next week is the final service of us, so we're trying to quite a few people over in attendance of us. We wish them the very best. That is a, a close of time for a church that was birthed in 1889. So they have had a long run and their mission is coming to an end. Uh, so we, we do uh, wish them well and for all the members to find a home church. And if you are from us and you're watching today, we do invite you to join us here at Grace Street. Before we uh, worship God with some music, let's go to God. Our Father God, we just thank you for this beautiful day that you've given us. Father, even when there's challenges <coughs> such as barricades up for a, a mile fun run, Father, we still can find our way to you, find our way to your church where we can worship you, where we can celebrate you and what you have done for us. Father, be with us today as we worship in song and we hear a sermon that you have placed on Pastor Mark's heart. And let, us, let it just resonate with us. And so when we walk out of this place, Father, that we are renewed and we are changed and, and we are wanting to do more for you in the kingdom. In Jesus' name. No. 
Heavenly Father, we just thank and praise you for this day. Lord, we just want to turn our hearts and our minds towards you now and, and have our ears listen to the message that you have put on Mark and Terry's heart today to deliver us. And we just pray for them. Uh, they're wonderful pastors, and, and we just are so blessed to have them, Lord. And, and we just want to be in tune to the message that you have given them to give us. Fighters versus Flyers is Fighters versus Flyers is our sermon title today that Mark is going to be bringing to us. And the passage that Mark chose this morning for our call to worship comes from 1 Samuel 17, verse 11. And here what the writer says, he says, When Saul and all of Israel heard these words from the Philistine, they lost their courage and were terrified. And I give this some context. The Philistine is Goliath. And Israel, I mean, can you imagine looking up at this guy? He was ahead of an immensely frightening sight. Well, what is your Goliath in your life? What do you see and you get to where you lose your courage and you're terrified? My family is not, I, well, I have one daughter who will ride roller coasters with me because the rest of them are terrified. <laughs> and I love watching videos online of people that people take on these. And some of these are ones where they go straight up and then they, when they come down, they don't just go straight down, they come down and they curve and then go off. And I don't know why, that just, I love that. <laughs> When I was a kid, I walked out onto the bridge that goes over the Royal Gorge. If you've ever been there and you've looked over the side, you know how terrifying that can be. What in your life is terrifying you and causing you to lose your courage? As we listen to the sermon this morning and, and hear what um, God has placed on Mark's heart, think about that. What is the thing that causes you to be terrified. What loses your courage? And I know Mark's going to touch on it. It's going to, this is going to be in his message. He's going to tell us how we can get past that in our lives. Not necessarily for roller coasters or walking across bridges, across deep gorges, but how we can get through our daily lives. I mean, yesterday we were a little bit taken aback when we found out that there was going to be a fun run here, but it didn't terrify us. We didn't lose our courage. We just knew that we needed to make a few adjustments and everything would be fine and God's, God's glory would be given. So, Father God, as Mark comes up here to uh, give
give us the message this morning. We just thank you for his heart for you, Father. We thank you that he has the courage and that he is not terrified and he is willing and able always to preach your word and to teach your word and, and when people want to hear about you, that, that he's willing to just go ahead and talk about you, Father, that you've given him that courage. Father, give us that same courage. Father, let us hear the words that Mark has for us this morning. Let them enter our hearts. Let them not just be a heart thing. Let them be a head thing, Father, that we can process what you want us to do through these words and we can go out into the world and do just those things. Father, we thank you again for Pastor Mark and this message. In Jesus' name. Well, good morning, church. How's everybody today? Good morning. A lot of you are ready to go. You bet. I was amazed yesterday. I actually got out and danced. Oh, and, yes. You know, for me, that's that's doing something. I've got a replacement knee and a reconstructed ankle, so I usually don't go out and do those things. But you know, I just had to. I just felt that spirit just draw me in yesterday, and I had to get out there and dance. And I had just lovely dances for my wonderful wife. And, it was just an awesome, awesome, awesome day. So uh, thank God for that and, and, and his spirit being amongst us yesterday. So today we're going into uh, week three, or sermon three in our series of living a courageous life. And it's based on the movie Courageous. And that's going to be uh, being reintroduced out into the markets again here in September. And so today we're going to be talking about fighters versus flyers. And... Uh, so when we think about that, we think about trying to be courageous in the midst of situations and things. And so in week one, we heard about being courageous versus being complacent and having uh, a devil that may care attitude about what goes on in life, but really leads us to whether we step up or step away. And it left us with the thought, if not you, then who? If it's not going to be up to you to bring forth God's word to the world, who's going to do it? Who's going to step up? Who's going to be that leader in the family? And what kind of legacy are you leaving for your children and your children's children and into their generations? And last week, we heard from Pastor Terry, and he explored the topic of warrior versus wimp, and, uh, which I thought was kind of a catchy title there. And whether we stand in and fight for what we know is right, knowing God is with us and is in control, or we run and hide and allow fear to rule our lives. So this week, we looked into fighters versus flyers. So in the animal kingdom, when we take a look at that, there is an inbred response that involves kind of stress and stressors in animals. And it's a fight or flight response and all animals are inbred with that so we we all have that inane uh, response built into our very being and so animals are inclined to flee or flight when impending dangers such as a predator or in vinyl, environmental stressor uh, fires and things like that they know to run away from the danger and to try and flee and escape and save themselves. And for a human, the response is based on an infinite number of factors. It's not just simply a cut and dry, hey, I'm in danger, it's time to do something, but it can range anywhere from uh, fear to friends, from habits to hang-ups, and it's true in the animal kingdom that sometimes fleeing is much more an indication of weakness, but of wit knowing what to do and when to do it. And sometimes we have to choose whether to stand up and fight a powerful enemy or to wisely flee. And it's not running away from the problem, but when we think about that type of flight response at that point in time, it's doing what's right in that situation. And in the case of fatherhood, Fight or flight is what you teach your kids, not what you do to them. And I would like to expand that out because this movie of Courageous is asking fathers to step up and father their families. 
not just father the children, but father the families. Stand up and be the head of the household. Be responsible for your family. And that means to fight for your family. That means not to run away from problems, but to stand there and fight for the responsibility that you have for your family. And there's perhaps no better or worse picture of this in the Bible than is in that familiar story that we all know about David and Goliath. And uh, so when we think about that, we, we think about that story where you have, as Terry said, this massive Philistine guy, and he was a giant according to the word. And, you know, he would stand out there and taunt. And so we think about that. What giants do we face in our everyday lives out here that taunt us, that just dare us to do something, that ask you to cross a line that maybe you shouldn't cross? And so you have a moral dilemma that pulls and, and tugs at you in there and becomes kind of larger than life. And I want you to hang on to that thought process as we go through the rest of the message today. Last week we heard from Terry as he told about Israel's plight of disobeying God and turning from him and the retribution that God inflicted upon them. And it was a continuous cycle that the Israelites, and for them, they, they just never seemed to get it right. They never learned that lesson. And see, as we look back in history, I kind of like history. As a kid, I never did. I didn't like it in school. But, you know, I started building exhibits for the History Center years and years ago. And as I learned more about that, because you really have to get in depth to build the exhibits. And so I started learning about history and I saw, you know, how important history was in our everyday lives today. Because history is cyclical. It, it repeats itself over and over again. And if you don't learn from your mistakes, you're bound to make those mistakes generationally, over and over and over again. And that's what was going on with the Israelites. But the important thing to notice in that is in all of those stories, God never left them, even though they fled from him. So God never left the Israelites. He kept bringing back and coming back and said, okay, let's try this. And so he, he used several different scenarios to try and get the Israelites to stay engaged with God. To stay engaged with God. And see, that's what we have to do as parents and as fathers and our families, is we have to stay engaged with our family. Regardless of what's going on outside of the world today, regardless of what we face personally, we have a moral obligation. We have responsibilities to our family, to stay engaged with our families. And I think that's all based on love. And, and that's what I loved seeing yesterday, is we, we felt that love surrounding us in there, and we had connection yesterday. And everybody that I saw in the whole place yesterday was engaged. Everybody. It was, it was awesome. So God stood by his promises and kept his end of the deal well through that litany of Israel's monarchy. We see that history repeating itself over and over again. A self-destructive pattern one of not learning from the mistakes of the past and establishing an example of hope for generations to follow, but instead they established a legacy of failures for future generations. And see that defeatist uh, attitude that they took at that point in time, they, they kept reverting back to the wrong things to do. And so following Israel's occupancy of the promised land, that led in Joshua's death. A new generation of Israelites were born who did not know God or the mighty things that he had done. If we look in Judges 2.10, it talks about that whole litany of things that happened with the people of Israel and how they just kind of faded away from God and they left all their responsibilities and they left those covenants that God had between himself and the people. And they left them behind. A horrible cycle of disobedience began where Israel would rebel, be oppressed, cry out to God, then be rescued by God, by a judges, men and women who were called to speak God's truth and rescue God's people. So when we look at that book of Judges, when I was a kid, when I went through the whole thing in Sunday school and I was going through these things, I was going, what does this mean? Why do I have to read this? 
And unless you really go through and understand the rest of the story and what it was important for, then it never will make sense to you. But once you look at it in the right context, it was this act of God coming back to rescue his people over and over and over again, even though they fled away from him, even though they turned away from God. The book of Judges ends with startling words, and it says, In those days there was no king in Israel, and everyone did what they wanted. And that comes from Judges 21-25. That moral society that they had broke down into debauchery and chaos. It was a moral anarchy that led to a time of struggle. And when we look at our society today, we see a similar view to what they experienced then. And we need to note that in spite of all this, God was still there for them in the midst of us, even as he is in the midst of everything we go through today. And all we have to do is turn back to God. He's always there. The answer for our moral dilemmas is there. The answer to all the problems that we face, to the stressors that we have, is there. We need to turn back and rely upon God. That's what he's wanted the whole time. So the book of Ruth begins with famine, and it ends with the birth of several soon-to-be kings. And the first of those was Samuel, and he, entered, he ushered in this monarchy. And the prophets and priests protected the, and prescribed the word of God in those days. And when God's word and perfected visions were scarce, then we look in this and we, we go on into Samuel in here. We look at chapter 8 and it talks about the warnings against their faithful prophet Samuel. And the people demanded to have a king. They, they thought the answer to all their problems was to have a king. But see, they already had a king, but they turned away. So as we come through here, it's really important to look at because I want you to think of what the people are asking for, what the people are saying in those times, and what the people are asking for today, and what they're saying in today's world. So it says in here in Samuel 8, 4 through 22, it said that to Samuel's dismay, the Lord commanded him to give in to their demands. And finally, all the elders of Israel met at Ramah to discuss the matter with Samuel. Look, they told him, you're old now, and your sons are not like you. Give us a king to judge us like all the other nations have. The elders of Israel were succumbing to the worldview that we have to have what everyone else has out there, and we must do what everyone else is doing. We hear this a lot in our world today. Regardless of its right, regardless of what it costs, regardless of what the future consequences of it might be, they just want to be the same as everybody else. I want to have what everybody else has. Let's do what everyone else is doing. It'll be a lot easier for us then. Everyone will be the same. No one will have anything to fight about. But what a mistaken way of thinking because it's never worked. If we go back and we talk about history and we look at it, you see that pattern over and over and over again and it's never worked out good for anybody at any time in history. And it's always ended up badly. So as we go on in Samuel, Samuel was displeased with their request and went to the Lord for guidance. And the Lord replied to him, he says, do everything they say to you, for they are rejecting me and not you. They don't want me to be their king any longer. And ever since I brought them from Egypt, they have continually abandoned me and followed other gods. And now they're giving you the same treatment. Do as they ask, but solemnly warn them about the way that the king that they're asking for will reign over them. So here God is saying, hey, just let them go their own way and see how far they get without me. Let them go ahead and destroy themselves again. So Samuel did just that. And in verse 10, it continues on, it says, So Samuel passed on the Lord's warning to the people who were asking him for the king. This is how a king is going to reign over you, Samuel said. The king will draft your sons and assign them to his chariots and charioteers, making them run before his chariots. Some will be generals and captains in his army. Some will be forced to plow his fields and harvest his crops. And some will make his weapons and chariot equipment. The king will take your daughters from you and force them to cook and bake and make perfumes for him. 
He will take away the best of your fields and vineyards and olive groves and give them to his own officials. He will take a tenth of your grain and your grape harvest and distribute it amongst his officers and attendants. He will take your male and female slaves and demand the finest of your cattle and donkeys for his own use. He will demand a tenth of your flocks and you will be his slaves. When that day comes, you will beg for relief from this king you are demanding, but the Lord will not help you. And still, the people refuse to listen to Samuel's warning. Even so, we want a king, they said. We want to be like the nations around us. Our king will judge us and lead us into battle. And so in other words, those people of, of Israel, the elders that were gathered before him, says, just let us go back into bondage like we were in Egypt. We'll live as slaves to the government. Let them take all that we have and give it to others that didn't earn it. And then that will make everything all right. Oh, but we will want that king to get us our land that we want. And uh, we want him to lead us in the battle against anybody who doesn't think the same way that we do. Hmm. Sounds vaguely familiar, doesn't it? So God did give them a king. He did. There was no one more impressive or qualified than King Saul, who became Israel's first anointed king. And by the way of his disobedience later on, he became the first rejected king because he rejected God in the process. He thought he became God, and so God rejected him. So early in his career, Saul made a fatal mistake. He disobeyed God by failing to completely destroy the Amalekites and all their possessions as God had commanded him to do. A key part of the conventional covenant between God and Israel was obedience. Saul, as God's anointed king, was responsible for keeping that obedience and keeping that command. And here's where the story really gets interesting. We take a look at it. David was named as Saul's successor by the prophet Sam. However, before David could become a king, Saul would have to cease and desist, which was very unlikely. And so Saul sent out all of his armies to find David to capture him and to kill him so that he wouldn't be anointed and become king. And no matter where David ran to and hit him, Saul spent all of his time, all of his resources, trying to track down David so he could kill him, so he could remain king, so he could remain in control. And so, despite all of his best efforts, obviously, David survived, Saul did not. So, Saul was desperate, and he contacted a medium to tell him the outcome of the battle that he was about to face. And this angered God because, see, Saul didn't come to God, he went to a medium. He went to the dark side, so to speak, in Star Wars. The medium said that if Saul went into the battle, that he would lose and he would possibly die. So he went into that battle already defeated. So before the battle even began, Saul was defeated because this medium told him, Hey, no matter what you do, you're going to go in, you're going to lose. And so he went into that battle already defeated. When Saul and Israel heard the words from the Philistine, they lost their courage and were terrified. And so this, to uh, set the stage for this, being challenged by Goliath became an all-out war. Israel's face off with the Philistines brought in a, a new kind of battle. It would be the survival of the fittest. A fight to the death and the winner takes all. So the stage is set for the epic fight of the ages. And the Philistine giant versus a small shepherd boy entered the future king, ready to tackle the challenge of fighting that Philistine. And see, David went in to defend the honor of God that he knew. He was faithful to God in what he was doing. So he went in with God by his side. His faith ensured him of the outcome of the battle before he began. 
Do you see the difference between Saul and David? Saul went in, he saw the dark side over here. Somebody to tell him what the future was going to be. A soothsayer, as some of the translations say, or a medium. But David consulted God, and God went with him in battle. So God sent a small boy to do a man's job. All of Israel's finest soldiers, trained warriors, stood on the sidelines for days and days and days. As this Philistine stood down in the valley, and you have the Philistines up on one hill over here, and you've got the Israelites on the hill over here, and in between them is a valley, and this tall giant of a man was down in the, in the Goliath, was down in the middle of the valley taunting the Israelites saying, just one of you, just one of you come down. They had already agreed that whoever won the battle was gonna get it all. It was winner take all, whole new type of battle. And yet all of Israel's finest soldiers stood up there frightened, frightened at the tauntings of this Goliath. One man. So God sent a small boy Saul provided David reasons why his plan wouldn't work. David went to Saul and said, hey, I can defeat this guy. I know I can do this. And Saul had no faith. Saul wasn't looking at it from the point of God was going with David. He'd already turned away from God. David was just a boy with no formal training. Goliath was a professional fighter. This should have been enough to keep David back in the fields, but God had a different plan for him. And I believe you know the rest of the story, but what's important to note here, it wasn't the size of the army. It wasn't a superior weapon that won the battle. It was David's faith in God, his obedience to God's promises, and his relationship with God his father in heaven, that gave him the boldness, that gave him the courage to go and fight out and to win the battle. And see, that's what made the difference. That's what made the difference. Who do you go into battle with? Who do you have on your side? Do you go into battle alone? Or do you want to go into battle with someone who's going to give you the outcome that you need to have? I believe, you know, and we have three points that I want to take with you when we get done with this today. And I believe that uh, as we face parenting in here, because as we look at this whole thing, parenthood is frightening and we face many Goliaths in our lifetime. But see, fleeing for us is not an option. We can't run away. We have our responsibilities. We have responsibilities to our family. We have the responsibilities to our children. We have to stand for our families and we have to fight for them. And again, I ask that question, if not you, then who? Who will fight for your family? Who's gonna go in and do it for you? In this society today, we see far too many fathers that flee, mothers that flee because they don't wanna have to face the responsibility of raising that family. For Saul, becoming king was his greatest joy, but it became quickly his biggest challenge. As the leader, he focused on the size of the problem and not the size of his God. And as such, he met his match. The problem was bigger than he thought he could handle on his own, and he was defeated before that fight ever began. As moms and dads, the day we hold our kids for the first time is that, Life's greatest joy, there's just nothing like holding that newborn baby in our arms. But at that same time, that from that moment forward, it becomes our greatest challenge and often presents itself as the biggest of giants. Is raising that child and raising that child properly. It's a big challenge. So in response to such a giant, our choices are always to stand and fight or flee in flight. Sadly, that was uh, pointed out by Terry last week. We have those statistics of 24 million children in this company whose fathers have simply left, opting for a life other than full-time care of the family that they
get started. Shirking their responsibility and leaving it up to somebody else to handle. Cowardly. Many of these kids have been fathered in the foundation of a family where the mother and father exchanged wedding vows and made promises that are now broken. Regardless of the situation, fatherhood can be frightening. Parenthood can be frightening. But it must never be flung from. We must never flee from that. Our responsibility is too great, and the stakes for our children, and our children's children, and for generations to come. That responsibility is too great. That responsibility is too great. <coughs> Point number two is parenthood is frightening, but to do nothing is not an option. David had already seen God's hands in smaller successes, and that was Time to trust God with that ultimate, that ultimate challenge, that ultimate task. It was time to fight the biggest of the foes, and it's not enough to be in your own home. You must leave your home, fathers, parents. You must leave your own home. You must be the head of your family. And I put that in bold print in my notes in here. You must be the head of your own family. The soldiers in Saul's army didn't flee the scene of battle, but none of them stepped forward either. The scene is the Israelite army on one hill and the Philistines on the other. And you got Goliath in the middle. But see, they didn't come to do battle. They just stood on the sidelines and watched. Parenthood is frightening. But doing nothing is not an option. So as a church, we can't assume that just because we have a father in the home or a mother in the home that everything is okay. And that they're being that mom or they're being that dad. We need to step up and step forward and make sure that they have the support that they need to really parent and to be able to raise the family in a godly atmosphere with God at their side. The church's role is to support and encourage and equip. There's a difference between watching a battle on the front lines and fighting in one. There's a difference between front row seats and playing the game. And it's time to courageously fight for the lives of your wives and your children. There's a real giant out there demanding the surrender of our children today. And it's popular culture, and it's moral relativism. It's sin, and if it's left unchallenged, it'll bark the door of your home and bank your children as that prize. And before you know it, you don't have them anymore. You lose your children to the world. I noticed there's a, when I was doing some research for this, I was reading, uh, they have a study that they came out, and they said since the age of the television and since the age of the video games and things like that, that they've been left to raise the children. And so the content of those games, the content of the television that they watch, the content that they take in is really shaping the future of the children, not the parents themselves. That's a very, very frightening thought if you ever listen or watch those games. And you look at what they're putting out there on television and it's definitely not scriptural. It's not God-based for the most part. I'll let you tune in to something that is specific for that. Parenthood is frightening, but we must fight against that fear. 1 Samuel 17 doesn't give us a picture of David to entertain fear of anything but the Lord. His confidence was in God. His God is bigger than our fear and stronger than our foes. When David went into battle, God went with him at his side. Just like Caleb and Joshua before him, as we heard in, in Pastor Terry's message last week. David's face was met with opposition. Saul gave him all the reasons why David couldn't stand against that fellow scene. But when David went into battle, he wasn't wearing another man's armor, but the strength and the favor and when David went into battle, David won. 
He was the least likely candidate to be named king, but God instructed the prophet Samuel not to look the man's outward appearance, but at his heart. For David to dishonor the Lord was more grave to him than defeating or defying that giant. Parenting presents its own set of challenges, and parenting is hard work. Sometimes it seems that doing the right thing and standing up for conviction, disciplining your children, being consistent in boundaries and persistent in love, although sometimes tough love. See, they only serve to win that, that badge that we wear of unpopularity with our kids. Boy, I, don't, I know that. My daughter and I, she didn't want to talk to me for almost five years, and then all of a sudden, she turned 21, and it was like somebody flipped the switch, and I got a new daughter back. And we get along fantastic, but boy, there was a time that those teenagers, I'm not sure what it's all about, but you know. But see, sometimes it takes that tough love. And sometimes it's hard on you when you have to have that tough love. Because of each of these endeavors takes hard work, many husbands and wives find it easier to take that easy route. Spoiling your kids is easier. Keeping up the Joneses is, is more comfortable. Letting television, cell phones, video games occupy your kids' time is easier than spending the time with them. Focusing on grades, athletic achievement can become easier than developing a godly character for your kids. Raising God-fearing, fruit-bearing Christ followers seems to be a giant to most families. One compared to just letting the kids grow up under their own shades of gray in the world that's around us. If we leave it up to them, what future are they going to have? How are they going to present that to their children? And what are they going to present to their children and to future generations? Families can be active in their responsibility to raising a generation who knows the Lord, remembers what he has done, and recognizes what he is doing in the world today. As Paul Harvey would say, you know the rest of the story and you know the ending. David killed Goliath. And there was another moment in the uh, life of King David that is all too familiar as well, and that is the story of David and Bathsheba. I can't just paint a story of King David as being a saint because he wasn't. So just like all the rest of us, and he was a sinner. <coughs> He had his dark moments as well. It'd be really nice to leave that one alone today, but the connections are too clear. When David, as a young man, faithfully stood up to fight, he honored God and killed a giant. Then as an older man, when David abandoned the battlefield, where he should have been out fighting the good fight, he fell into sin. The moment in life when he would have been right to flee was the moment when David chose to stay engaged at the wrong time and in the wrong way. We have to be constantly vigilant as fathers and mothers that we are fighting the good fight and that we are not allowing ourselves to be engaged in the wrong activities. The consequences of what David did lasted for generations and had it not been for David's willingness to stand and fight against his pride and humbly repent of his sin, those consequences might still be in effect today. Sometimes parents, in the context of the flight, we get distracted by their sin and neglect to consider how the sin deeply affects their family. And as such, we need to stand up and fight against sin in our lives and in the lives of our children as well. We are not trapped by our sin. I want to make that perfectly clear today. We are not trapped in our sins. By the grace of God, through Jesus' sacrifice, we don't have to fight that fight for the rest of our lives. That fight begins and ends in confession and repentance. Repentance takes courage, maybe just as much as facing a giant. See, we must fight against evil and against complacency and against fear. We must flee from temptation and protect our kids from the same. We must do it to the honor of our Lord God. We must do it to fulfill our vows as men and women of God 
to fight for what is right than to run from what we fear. I said this in a prior sermon, and I think it bears repeating today. A life lived in faith overcomes a life lived in fear. A life lived in faith overcomes a life lived in fear. And as for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. Let us pray. Father God, as we face our fears, when we are feeling afraid and when we are feeling timid, when we are tempted to flee, remind us of who you are and who we are in you. You are strong and courageous, the almighty King and the loving Father. You have said in your word as we wait upon you, we can take courage because we know that you are with us, that you are for us, that you will empower us with the courage and strength we need, whatever is placed before us. Remind us of who you have created us to be and what you have empowered us to do. Lord, you are the courageous one, and as of right now we wait upon you, we, as we face our fear and intimidation, we trust you will keep your promise. We trust that I am who you say I am. I trust that you will give me the courage and strength to face any circumstance. And I trust that victory is on the other side. We've all been declared that we will not fear or intimidation. Let it stop us or bring us into disobedience. Help us to endure, Lord. Give us grace. Show us mercy. Surround us in love. You're a good Father. You're faithful. We trust in you. Thank you, Father. As I was just listening and meditating over the words that uh, Mark was sharing with us this morning, there's a, a band, many of you might not have heard of it, many of you may have, it's called Go Fish. And just shy of 10 years ago, they came out with a song called My God. And those words kept running through my head. It's just the, the chorus to this. It's my God is so big and so strong and so mighty, there's nothing my God cannot do it. And then would, there was a clap in there. And yes, Bruce, I'm challenging you to sing that song. <laughs> but it's true. Our God is so big and so strong and so mighty. There's nothing that he cannot do, but we have to go to him first. That's exactly what Mark was talking about today. David went to God first. He took on bears and lions when he was a child. And then he took on Goliath. And then he became king, and he, as we all do, he screwed up. Been there, done that, read that book, wrote my own memoir. But then he remembered that his God was so big and so strong and so mighty, and he went back to him. And he was given God's grace. And that's exactly what we get from God as we prepare to celebrate communion today. Now, yesterday we showed how communion, uh, during the, the wedding ceremony, how the communion tied back to Jewish uh, custom. But the part that I want to focus on today is the fact that in Revelations it talks about that meal. The one that this is representing right now, right here, is preparing us and it pales in comparison. But it's a reminder of what that meal will be with Jesus in heaven. And the scriptures say in 1 Corinthians 11, Paul writes, For I pass on to you what I received from the Lord himself. On the night when he was betrayed, the Lord took some bread and he gave thanks to God for it. And then he broke it. And the pieces, and he said, This is my body, which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. And then the same way he took the cup.
cup of wine, and after supper, saying, This is the cup of the new covenant between God and his people. An agreement confirmed with my blood. Do this in remembrance of me, as often as you drink it. For every time that you eat of this bread and drink of this cup, you are announcing the Lord's death until he comes again and preparing for that heavenly meal. Father God, we know you are so big and so strong and so mighty, and there is nothing you cannot do. Father, let us give us this time of communion, this time of us taking the Lord's Supper as one where we do it in remembrance of what Jesus did for us on the cross, but also in hope of that meal, that eternal time with you where we get to celebrate in heaven. Father, we thank you for all that you've done for us and what this meal represents in that we don't have to face fear alone. You were there and we can become fearless warriors for you, Father. In Jesus' name. So we've got uh, some prayer requests for today. Um, Becky popped on uh, to the feed this morning and she had to leave. Uh, she will be, she just, just not too very long ago, said goodbye to Richard. And now she is saying goodbye to Richard's father today at a celebration of life. So we, we're just keep her in your prayers today. We also want to keep Mike and Lisa uh, Peterson in our prayers today as they have their daughter Megan's celebration of life, a life cut short. We also want to thank God for what he's been doing in Denny's sister's life, Kim. She's been to the doctor, she's doing better. She's moving into a place, I, and you said this is relatively a pretty new place. That is awesome. God has been working and putting things into place for her, and we are just so thankful for all the prayers that we've had for her. We also want to keep Steve and Denise in our prayers. They're driving home from a wedding they were at in Wyoming yesterday. It, unlike Shannon and Bruce's, was outside in 90 plus degree heat. So, um, but uh, safe travels back for them. That's quite a drive on the way there. They were. What they said they were getting stopped like every few drive a car length stop, drive a car length stop. You could see, she took a picture and you could see semis as far as the eye could see along the road. So just save travels back from them. And then we also want to keep Mark in our prayers. He's, uh, as soon as he packs up today from service, he's going to jump in his car and he's driving off to Peoria uh, for work and he'll be gone through Thursday. So uh, more travel, but every other week for the next several weeks. So, uh, we want to keep him in prayer. Uh, is there any other prayers that we want to lift up today? Absolutely. Lifting up their marriage. Actually, Shannon, would you come over here and, and stand by Bruce for just a moment? Hmm. Yes, they're getting ready to go on their honeymoon. And, um, if anybody wants to join me up here, we're going to just pray over them and, and their new life together. Gracious and loving Father, we've got all these prayer requests before you, Father, and you are so big and so mighty. We thank you for that, Father. But right now, we're just wanting to celebrate with Bruce and Shannon for their new life together, their, their love and their love for you and for them, each other. Father, we ask for safe travel as they head down for some time away, some time of renewal, between themselves and getting, just spending time together and celebrating this new life that they're starting. Father, we thank you that we got to be a part of that yesterday, and we just look forward to seeing 
was able to use mightily in your kingdom. In Jesus' precious and holy name we pray. Mercedes and Jesse are joining us all the way from Texas, and, and we just love you for what you have done for us. It's kind of funny because today I feel weepy. Yesterday, I, I, uh, I'm going to let you in on a little family uh, humor, but uh, there was a bet between Shannon and Taryn on whether or not I would cry. And so before the wedding, Tyrion goes, first you're going to have to suck it up and be a man because I got five bucks that you're not going to cry. <laughs> <laughs> and so I managed not to cry. Now I feel like crying. Won't cost you anything. Tyrion probably says, go ahead. It won't cost you <laughs> um, But anyway, um, there's a hymn from the 1800s that uh, is based on a little church in Nashville, Iowa, Central Iowa. And... Uh, Every time I drive by there, I stop in and pray at their altar. They still, to this day, have hundreds of weddings in that little teeny brown church, and, and I want to share that with you today. There's a church in the valley by the wildwood, no lovely spot in the day.
through us to others. May we be your hands to bless others, and may you guide our feet to places where we can go and be a blessing. May our speech be so that we speak words of comfort and encouragement and speak the truth of God and love. Let us have the great grace, gift of peace, enable us and embolden us to be available when others are in need, Lord, we pray that you would increase in our lives and that we may decrease before others so that the blessings that you pour out through us to others may draw us, each and every one of us, closer into your arms, Lord Jesus. Thank you, Father God, that your grace is all sufficient for all your children, including all those who are facing persecution and dangers in so many parts of this world, so many from broken families, Lord. Lift up those 24 million children who are in need of your grace and your mercy today, but more importantly, your love. Lord, we pour our, our hearts to all our brothers and sisters in Christ, and we know that we are all in one in you, and the pain that one suffers becomes a communal distress for all of the body of Christ. And so, Lord, we lift up all those who are having to contend with problems and dangers and difficulties in their lives, comfort and strength strengthen each person who is suffering. Draw close to each and every one of us so that in your strength we might persevere in these troublesome times and in doing so bring glory to you and serve as a faithful witness to those who are lost in their sins. Help us to show forth your grace and goodness as a beacon to others. Comfort and surround each hurting heart. Bless those who are in need of healing and bring relief to those who are in need and keep each one of us firm in the faith that we have in you. Through Christ Jesus our Lord, thank you, Lord, that there is not one of us, your children, who is lost in your eyes. And we lift up each and every one of us to you today. In your holy name we pray. Amen. Amen. And all God's children sing.